Good evening, ma'am. I welcome you to my podcast, and I'm really thankful that you gave me time to come up for this podcast. Well, the pleasure is all mine. <laughs> Thanks okay. for inviting me over. Okay. Uh, so, as for the audience, I have the very first thing to ask you. So, who okay. is Doctor Nevedita Bab Bab Asu, and what you do, and who are you? Okay, that's that's a pretty difficult question, right? Who am I? <laughs> But I well, um, professionally, I currently work in Intel as an yield analysis engineer. And before shifting to industry, I did my PhD from IIC Bangalore in 2018, and then I moved to Ireland um, as a postdoctoral researcher, and then finally shifted to industry. and personally i am very motivated and you know enthusiastic individual i'm like a go getter i'm always excited about stuff and i'm like if i want that i'm going to do that and i believe in giving 100% to everything that i do and uh, yeah i'm fun loving and uh, like as you can see i'm always full of energy <laughs> and i always laugh so yeah that's me <laughs> Wow, that's great. That's great. So, talking about a basic about your education. So, uh, yeah. you have been a Raman Chach Amparak Fab Hello in France for eight eight right. months. So, please tell us right. about it. Like, what it is and what does it mean and what does a fellow do? Right, right. So, basically, in so I joined uh, IIC as a PhD researcher in two thousand twelve, right? Hmm. And uh, in two thousand fifteen, I think my supervisor was going for a sabbatical, and uh, I thought, okay, um, this is my opportunity to you know try uh, do collaboration outside India because he won't be there. Mm -hmm. and uh, there won't be much guidance from him so then i started looking up for you know this fellowships like mid phd fellowships i don't i i i i don't know if there are like um, lots of them but i know a couple of them so mm -hmm. raman charpak fellowship um, rsm fellowship i think it's called robert macnamara fellowship and then there's other one called uh, newton baba fellowship so these are all mid phd fellowships right okay. Okay. where you can do research which mm -hmm. is related to what you have been doing in phd mm -hmm. and then uh, you know find a host uh, mm -hmm. in a country mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know make them agree that they will host you as mm -hmm. a fellow for say 6 to 10 months right okay. and uh, so you know i thought yeah okay this is an opportunity for me to venture out Mm -hmm. and then i started looking up for all these fellowships on google of course mm -hmm. and then i applied for the three fellowships that i just named mm -hmm. and i got a uh, offer for raman charpak fellowship so basically the first step of this fellowship is that um, you have to find someone uh, mm -hmm. so raman charpak fellowship is like a indo french fellowship so it's okay. like between india and france so you have to so if you are an indian mm -hmm. you have to find a supervisor in france Mm -hmm. and if you like are applying from france you have to find a supervisor in india so mm -hmm. somebody who will agree to you know host you and work mm -hmm. with you and mm -hmm. who is aligned with your research mm -hmm. so the first step is to make someone agree to host mm -hmm. and then if he agrees then mm -hmm. you know or she agrees then you write a proposal together mm -hmm. which is strongly related to your phd work so far mm -hmm. and then uh, and then you just apply and wait for results that's about yes. it so uh, um, uh, so the one thing that i wanted to ask how you uh, ended up being in the field of research like was it a motivation from the very early stage or something that happened that actually mo motivated you to go towards this field this field of right, research yeah so i am a very you know uh, in the moment person so okay. my like when i look back now my mm -hmm. entire career has been you know in the moment like whatever i felt like i did and uh, thanks to my parents they never mm -hmm. like you know stopped me from doing anything so when i was in school right i wasn't at all interested in science so mm -hmm. i wanted to do uh, for zoo humanities mm -hmm. and i wanted to be a journalist Wow. <laughs> and, um, like you know uh, i think it was the cargill war around in you know 1999 around and then barkha that was the foreign correspondent mm -hmm. reporting for war mm -hmm. so that kind of like i was like okay i want to be barkha that i want to be a journalist <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. So then my 12th board exam happened mm-hmm. and then I scored like really well in all the science subjects and I did not <laughs> score so well in you know English and all the other stuff. So then um, my mom was like this is a sign that you are not meant <laughs> for uh humanities. So you know just like just because I had better marks mm-hmm. in uh, physics mm-hmm. I started you know studying physics like with no real like I liked physics and maths I was good at it but I wasn't really passionate right mm-hmm. and then uh, uh the first year while I was doing physics I was like why am I doing this <laughs> and then uh in the second year it got a little better mm-hmm. uh, like you know there were optics and all that which I kind of found interesting mm-hmm. and then in third year like uh, I was introduced to quantum mechanics which just kind of you know changed everything for me and um, i became really passionate about physics and you know nano science in general mm-hmm. and then my masters was uh, obviously based on the fact that i got passionate about <laughs> it and that, that's why i did a masters um, and then i think when i was doing my masters i really loved what i was studying right like i could just study uh, you know 12 14 hours straight just you know like so i am not a very studious student in general you know like, like, i i don't like uh, i mean if i don't like something i can't study it right so in, in uh, masters uh, you know i got to know that you know uh, nano physics has a great application in electronics like you can mm-hmm. uh, you know use the use the principles of uh, nano science like you know uh, in um, semiconductor devices right mm. and that avenue opened up which i found really fascinating like you know mosfets and uh, bipolar transistors and all that that was really you know uh, kind of like a turning point for me okay. and then um, i did my masters project on epidactyl growth so that kind of uh, you know got me interested in uh, nanotechnology mm-hmm. right and uh, so at the end of my masters i i had this fellowship so this fellowship is called dst inspire fellowship mm-hmm. which uh, you get when you top your university mm-hmm. in masters right so i had this fellowship and this fellowship like enables you to go do research anywhere in india and mm-hmm. you have your own fundings right so mm-hmm. it's very easy to you know once you get that fellowship it's pretty easy to get through uh, into any institute in, in india because then they know that you have your own funding mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. they don't have to you know bring funds or something so you are not a liability you mm-hmm. already have your funding. so mm-hmm. then like uh, i like i applied um, so okay so basically after my masters i i i thought that you know i can really so i used to read a lot of you know mm. artic, uh, like uh, articles on uh, cmos technology cmos sensors just out of curiosity mm. and um, you know and when you write say sops right state mm. of purpose when you're applying for a phd abroad right it, like what i what i feel is that you, you should kind of be you know involved and passionate about uh what you're doing uh, yeah. to write a good yeah. statement of purpose yes. right yes. so yeah. you know so so i was curious and then yeah. you know uh for you know writing a very original and very um authentic sop <laughs> i kind of you know used to study all this stuff and then uh, this uh, one particular uh, i think back then one particular uh, article like it was like you can use cmos uh, sensors to mm-hmm. detect you know biological signals like blood flow and all mm-hmm. that so that got me really interested and i was like i am going to use my knowledge of mm-hmm. uh, semiconductors and nanophysics and you know semiconductor physics uh, into making something which can detect biological signals and mm-hmm. that was the whole motivation of you know doing a phd wow. so 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 yeah, that's that's my journey. <laughs> wow, that's good. That's good. So as I I might have heard her wrong, but you said that even if you don't like something, you can mm-hmm. study it for hours. Okay. 
No, the opposite. Like if opposite. I don't like something, something. Okay. yeah, I can't. You know, I really, uh, I really sometimes can't understand how somebody can study for twelve hours. Like, yeah, you know, I feel sleepy, sleepy after two hours. I'm like, okay, gone. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I mean, if I don't like something, hmm. then you know, I can't even sit down for one minute. Like, <laughs> I can't focus. So that's why, like you know, in my when I was doing my first year of physics bachelor's, mm-hmm. like I was so disinterested in it that mm-hmm. like I kind of almost flunked my first year. <laughs> okay. So my, in my bachelor's, I was the last, uh, you know, last person in my class. Like, <laughs> so, so th- that like I I don't know like if you like something, probably you can just you know spend hours. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you know doing it like yeah. i think just like like you were recording this at 12:00 am at night right <laughs> thank you're so passionate much. about it. <laughs> thanks so. so much thanks so much ah uh, okay <laughs> okay so uh, so talking about you you have been into iit bomb bomb being a jf right. and your yeah. phd is from iisc bangalore so right. uh, here i would like to ask you have been in two top most institutes of india Right. now how is ias iisc bangalore day 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 different or similar to iit bombay matlab if you have to compare both of them okay um i think they are a bit different you know like so um in in iisc the the bachelor's program the masters program they are so i don't know if many people know this but uh, there is a bs degree in iisc bangalore mm-hmm. and uh, where you have a four year course uh, it's it's like a bs degree from say usa right mm-hmm. where bs degrees are four years not three years like in india so so there, there's this uh, bs degree and then there's masters in science and masters in technology and then there's integrated masters phd program in iisc apart from phd mm-hmm. right? so all these programs right are very research oriented like uh, so so people um, like you know young people who go to iisc they are you know molded in such a way that even if they were in passion and about research they they would be after you know doing a course wow. in uh, iisc like when i was doing my phd i had to do coursework right so yeah. i uh, took a course uh, like a bachelor's course in iisc yeah. and uh, uh, i was it was really interesting like you know how the bs students in iisc are taught like they were obviously very good because they are probably the top 1000 rankers in iitz or you know there's a separate exam i think kvpy or whatever mm-hmm. like they are yes, really yes. people but the way they were being taught i think uh, that that was kind of inspiring like as in i was thinking if i you know was sitting in this class in my bachelor's <laughs> i i could have got much motivated much earlier you know? <laughs> yeah, so yeah. uh that's iisc and then iit is like i don't know but in my childhood mm. um i like you know there used to be news on the papers mm. right that this 10 people from india has got the highest paid jobs <laughs> and <laughs> they were all like you know from iit uh, back then it was like computer mm. science and it was a huge thing right mm. uh, and all this so I always knew IITs in my mm-hmm. childhood as mm-hmm. somewhere you go study and mm-hmm. then you get a high paid job mm-hmm. <laughs> and I think a lot of people even now see IIT like that so y- you get into your bachelor's and it- mm-hmm. it's like a ticket to a high paid job so even the courses probably are kept that way you know mm-hmm. to mold you for a job maybe mm-hmm. so so curriculum wise there's a difference between mm-hmm. iisc and iit in terms of culture i think iisc is more populated with uh, what 25 and above people right mm-hmm. because like you know the phd is like they they probably start from say 23 24 and then the bs people like obviously they are young but they are very small in number like say mm-hmm. so there are 100 mm-hmm. every batch right mm-hmm. and then uh, masters and so you know it's full of mature people so the 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 culture is like the the vibe you know mm-hmm. the the that vibe is uh, probably a little less in mm-hmm. iisc 
Mm-hmm. Whereas in IIT, it's always, you know, there's always <laughs> this bustling of young people talking, chatting. And so, I mean, culture-wise, IIT is more vibrant. Like, and uh, IIC is, I wouldn't say it's dull, but it, it's a bit like the vibe is more matured and, you know, people keep to themselves. But uh, to be honest, like, from 2012 to uh, 2018, while I was there in ISC, I saw a shift in yeah. that uh, area. Like, you know, a lot of people started doing fests and, you know, started uh, doing uh, all this acting uh, uh, workshops. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, so it's, it, it, I mean, uh, ISC is catching up probably. <laughs> but yeah, but, you know, like, uh, just for, you know, fun fact. That uh, IIC didn't even have a convocation before 2012. You know, oh, like oh. so in IIC, it's like um, you're more like a sage. Yeah, you yeah. did your d- degree. That's fine. Everybody does their degree. You don't need to celebrate it. It's okay. <laughs> you know, that kind of. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> That's something new that I've heard to to heard it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay. We are lucky that, you know, we had our, like, I couldn't attend because I was in Ireland, but at least we had our convocation. But <laughs> before 2012, like, there wasn't any convocation. <laughs> okay, so this is something new that I've got to know. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Great. So, uh, apart from the IAT life, IAC life, you have been mm-hmm. a SFI industry fellow at Analog Day. So what it has been and what does an SFI industry fellow mean and what does it does? Right, right. So so basically, um, I, I think these fellowships are, you know, probably everywhere in the world. Mm. So, you know, right now we understand that you know, you do a PhD, you write mm. a thesis, and that's not the end of it, right? Mm-hmm. Like if, if you're you have to like uh, contribute uh, meaningfully to, mm-hmm. to, to, you know, to, to whatever, because, you know, so earlier it was like, you know, PhD graduates can just um, do research, be in academia and, you know, that's it, right? But right now there are lots of PhD graduates like coming out, right? And academia is kind of full because one position in academia lasts for what Right. So there is this huge shift, uh, you know, to to move to industry because obviously, you know, the limitations of chances in academia. Mm. And secondly, uh, our research has also become very industry oriented, right? As in, like, mm. where we we actually contribute to the to mm. you know all this. Um, uh, things that are necessary for the society, like sensors and, Mm. uh, you know, 5G communications and all that. So, so I think all, you know, governments of all countries, they Mm. kind of try to mold PhDs um, into the industrial setup or, Mm. you know, try, uh, so they, they are trying to bring in research from all these institutes to you know, play a role in in the companies in the industrial sector. So I think in India, DST has this kind of fellowships. Mm. So SFI fellowship is basically a Irish government fellowship where uh, they kind of you know. So the 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 process of application is the same, which is you have to first find a host like a company mm. which will mm. um, you know host you for a year and say that yeah okay you can work with us and uh, and then together you write a proposal and then you submit it and then um so so as so basically irish government uh, <clears throat> has started this fellowship where they try to you know bring uh, people from academia into industry and uh, make them see that you know it's a good world there too so mm-hmm. this is kind of a, a fellowship which binds uh, academia and industry. Kind of. wow, so, so when I joined as a postdoctoral uh, researcher in uh, Ireland, right? So I was al- already working w- on analog devices project. So it was kind of easy to find analog mm-hmm. devices as my host because they already saw me working. And uh, so I applied for it and I, I was working with analog, like as a, 
I a fellow, but in analog devices. Wow, that's great. That's great. So, what was your work actually there? Like, uh, like the work that you did at analog devices. I know right. that it has been very, very similar to what you have done as a part of your PhD. So, was it right. very, very same, or was it a different from what you have done as a part of your PhD? Well, like, uh, you know, <laughs> from 2012, I have been a jack of all trades. Like, mm -hmm. uh, so basically, even in my PhD, my PhD is like multidisciplinary, right? So, um, I mean, uh, I was doing a bit of biology, a bit of physics, a bit of nanotechnology, even in my uh, PhD. So, um, in analog devices, I wouldn't say it was completely same, but like, I mean, none of my, so every year, probably in my PhD, I have worked on different, you know, uh, <laughs> projects kind of. So in analog devices, it, it was kind of similar, but not exactly similar. Like it, it cannot be exactly similar. Like, mm. you know, like when people finish their PhD and they think that we will get a job, which is exactly similar to what <laughs> we did. It never PhD. happened. That's, that, that just doesn't happen. Right? That never yeah. happened. Even in your PhD, you're working on so many different things. Like, so. Yeah. So yeah, so it, it was kind of like similar, but not exactly similar. I tell you the same thing happened with me once. When I was about to start my PhD, I had this very specific thing in my mind that this is what I'm supposed to do as a part yeah, of my PhD. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, six months in the PhD, something else came out from that one. Right. One year I had PhD, something else came out. So I was like, okay, where am I going? So I just yeah, went to yeah. my guide. I mean, yeah. So I went to my guide and I asked her, okay, is this the work that we are supposed to do as a part of the PhD? And she was like, she was very helpful. She is like, okay, fine, you're doing it. Just keep on doing. You might reach some, somewhere and you somewhere, will reach somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, exactly. I mean, when people ask, like, you know, a lot of people message me on LinkedIn, right? And, you know, some of the questions, I just feel like, okay, <laughs> because, you know, like, some people, they have probably just been two months into the PhD program. And they're like, I don't like this PhD program. And I'm like, okay. nobody likes. Nobody likes. <laughs> <laughs> this can be a fifth law of the you know, universe. We don't like yeah. our <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Like <laughs> so next time if somebody comes with a question like this, give them the link of my channel. I will do all this. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> do sure. the handling work for you. <laughs> so uh, talking about your right now work. Right now you work as an uh, you work as a yield analysis engineer. Right. Fancy name. <laughs> Honestly, telling, I have to search it. <laughs> like, what does it actually yeah. mean? <laughs> so, I, like, I, even I audience, didn't have an idea when I joined. <laughs> for the audience, please tell me. Please tell, please tell them what it is and what it actually does and what you actually do as a being a yield as an assistant. Right. So, uh, so basically, um, you know, in a nutshell, hmm. our, our main uh, purpose of the job is to make money for Intel. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so, what we <laughs> so we are the money vehicle of Intel. <laughs> okay. So, so basically like, you know, Intel has a lot of products, right? Probably uh, in Intel Ireland, uh, there is uh, about 400 products that mm -hmm. are manufactured. Mm -hmm. So, um, so basically all these products, like mm -hmm. they, so, Firstly, like if you see the chain of semiconductor processing, right? Mm -hmm. So the front end is where people design all the circuits and, mm -hmm. you know, they, they kind of do a pre-silicon validation. So mm -hmm. that kind of work is done in, you know, Intel India or, you know, other companies in India, right? Mm -hmm. So, and then comes the manufacturing part of it where you fabricate this devices right mm -hmm. and then it comes down to labs and nanotechnology mm -hmm. and all of that right mm -hmm. so so that happens in intel ireland and mm -hmm. probably intel in usa and israel right so these devices are manufactured so that's the lab part and then what we do as yield analysis engineer is that we continuously monitor the health of these devices. So when when these devices are manufactured in the lab, right? So 
sometimes they are not up to standard mm. or sometimes uh, just like you know say the samsung seven note uh, book or whatever mm. so they went out and then they uh, they people returned the phone they were like you know bursting so our our role is to prevent that from happening one two and like you know always ensure that the products are healthy so the the basic job is to do a lot of data analysis right mm-hmm. and like so we get all this data from the lab mm-hmm. um, like so the processes are happening in the lab right so it's a virtual factory like mm-hmm. people work in it but most of it is virtual right mm-hmm. so people monitor all this you know tools and processes every parameter so mm-hmm. they continuously monitor that and then what we get is like a burst of data and then we kind of you know try to optimize uh, mm-hmm. the the quality of the product and mm-hmm. how like we can you know make this product cheaper mm-hmm. as well as you know in more quantity mm-hmm. and uh, more quality mm-hmm. so you know it's, it's like a, a web of things so mm-hmm. so basically it's like uh, uh, so yeah so it's kind of data analysis but then we are very involved with the processes in the lab as well so one is like the health of the products right and the second is how to make the manufacturing process better like mm-hmm. you know i don't know if you have learned i mean if you've heard of uh, lean six sigma and all these technologies to make manufacturing processes clutter free and you know less waste and all of that so so the second part is like you know to ensure so people you know do all these experiments in the lab to make the manufacturing process cleaner and then we kind of you know analyze that data and say that yeah okay the experiment is a success it's not mm-hmm. affecting uh, the products mm-hmm. but it is also you know cleaning up the manufacturing so it's like a uh, it had like my job has a lot of dimensions like mm-hmm. but at the base of it is like we analyze data and we make money for it so. <laughs> okay okay so i got to learn so many things especially right. what is the yield analysis in india so you are in ireland right so mm-hmm. coming from india going to ireland right. how is this journey has been I mean, what what is the one best thing you miss of india being in ireland oh uh, well firstly obviously family and friends and secondly <laughs> food <laughs> like I, I like you know i am a big fan of uh, all the street food in india which is very hard to get anywhere like you know and even if you get it it's not like india like can't be like india they cannot be because we have that special yeah, exactly. taste <laughs> yeah so you know there's no point talking about it so <laughs> until and unless that oil has been used 10 times the taste cannot yeah. come <laughs> like then the taste comes right <laughs> or you know, like why you have gold of power in people <laughs> when uh, the sweat the drops fingers. okay so we'll not talk about that okay <laughs> as of now okay okay so um, uh, coming back to how i got to know you i got to know you right. through your linkedin post the yeah. uh, stuff that you like uh, write on linkedin so mm-hmm. which shows that apart from being a good researcher you are also a good writer because you know it takes uh, a, yeah. a good amount of time a good amount of efforts to actually think up the stuff and write it in this way so uh, what i wanted to ask you is that what is what is your idea behind this linkedin post and how you think the stuff and how you make up the stuff and finally present it what's go and and what goes behind these posts well you <laughs> to be honest you know sometimes when i look around me i i i like i find people so strange maybe i am strange but from my perspective i find people so strange and um <laughs> so the, like you know like uh when there are hundreds of people you know <laughs> trying to get a job by you know right 
continuously modifying their resumes and working so hard. There are this group of people who thinks that they can just copy paste a message, like, you know, there's a very popular message on LinkedIn. Uh, so they just think that they will copy paste it and get a job. So, you know, all these kind of instances uh, motivate me to write. But to be honest, I started LinkedIn uh, last year in June, right? Uh, so the job that I got was actually through LinkedIn. So I, so I applied for this position uh, by seeing it on LinkedIn. Uh, and uh, it was kind of like I should, you know, pay it forward. So mm -hmm. the main mo motivation behind joining LinkedIn was uh, to help, you know, PhDs uh, if they are thinking of uh, moving to industry, kind of, you know, guide them. Because, um, like, I, I learned it the hard way. <laughs> and uh, I think a lot, lot of people on LinkedIn are doing the same kind of thing and a mm -hmm. lot of people like you are making podcasts so like to, to, um, I mean to 2021 is better than 2020 and 2020 was better than 2020 so people are you know waking up to this but the motivation was you know to pay forward uh, like I got a job from LinkedIn, so I should pay it forward. Kind of that was the motivation, honestly. Okay, so how you find the idea about to writing? It? Like I, I always like I like even when I was young, I used mm. to you know write journals. So writing just comes to me naturally, and uh, like honestly, it doesn't take much time to write a post. But yeah, I mean the thought behind it goes on, but writing it down doesn't take much time. <laughs> For me, it does. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So that's very okay. So that's very great. That's very good because I actually get sometimes very very inspired through your post. And uh, since a long time, I wanted to contact you for this podcast, but uh, never <laughs> got <laughs> enough the the strength to mail you. But now I did. <laughs> and so uh, the next thing that I want to ask you, okay, so, uh, so suppose I'm a PhD student who is just about mm -hmm. to start my PhD. So I come to you for an advice. So what kind of advice would you like to give me? Like I'm a new PhD student, I have, ju I have just started it. So what right. advice will you give to me? Well, I would say take it easy, tiger. Like a lot of young people, they just come and say, I like, you know, I'll do this, I'll do that, I'll do that, I'll do that. So even I was like that. <laughs> so, but you know, in PhD, like you just need to chill. <laughs> so like, you know, things will happen in its own pace. And, you know, since it's, especially in India, right? Like you need five to six years, especially in IIC, like you need six to seven years. So it's a long time. Uh, it's not like a master's degree or a you know, bachelor's degree that you know will end definitely within two years or four years or whatever. So PhD, like it can start very well, go bad after that, or it can start very slow, pick up pace. After. So, you know, you, you should keep all the scenarios in mind and from the first day on, be motivated, but don't burn yourself out or don't think that I'm going to do this like, in, mm. you know, in two years, three years, I'll just get it done with that mentality kind of burns you out. And it kind of like, I have seen a lot of people then kind of going into, you know, frustration, depression, you know, whatever. And so, so yeah, so I would say that. <laughs> okay, that's great. So uh, as since you have been in a PhD, you have been in a postdoc, and a JRF at IIT Bombay. So uh, uh, you, my, you, my, you, you won't have interacted with so many guides, like one at Bombay, yeah. IIT Bombay, one at IAC Bangalore, then do for yeah. your postdoc. So uh, one of the things that most of the PhDs face is how to handle their relationship with guide, with their PhD guide and supervisor. So any advice that you like to give to them who are facing a tr trouble with their relationship with their supervisor? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, it's, it's kind of tricky because, um, you know, in a job, uh, you have your manager, but then uh, if, if you don't like your manager, you can, you know, look for a new job. 
right? But for PhD, like, especially, um, you know, when you have invested two, three years, because it's a degree that you are going to earn, right? Mm. At the end of the day, it's about mm. you. Mm. Like, as in, uh, if, you, if you leave, it's it's uh, your loss, kind mm. of, right? So, so like, relationship with supervisor is uh, is a bit tricky. But I think, and I want to say this on this podcast, that people pay a lot of importance um, uh, about supervisors in PhD, but you can actually, you know, just be neutral and, mm-hmm. you know, not, I mean, just maintain a relationship, but not put too much focus on your supervisor, like just do your own work. Mm-hmm. Like, so, I mean, what, so when a supervisor is nice right Mm -hmm. that's great like you know he or she is involved in your growth and uh, you can just grow and you know that's great but when a supervisor is I wouldn't say bad nobody's good or bad it's just like he is not or she is not compatible with you Mm -hmm. right so that makes him or her bad but no person is like at the end of the day no person is good or bad it's not like Mm -hmm. so so what happens is uh, sometimes your supervisor is not compatible with your focus or mm. with your idea of your career, right? So at that point in time, I think when you realize that, instead of continuously fretting about it, like that, uh, oh my God, my supervisor is not supporting me. Oh my God, my supervisor is this, mm-hmm. supervisor is that. Just, you know, kind of try to uh, collaborate uh, outside, right? Like, you know, just write a mail to somebody saying that uh, I like your work and mm-hmm. you know, and start something on your own, like be proactive, like, you know, continuously talking about a bad relationship just makes it worse mm-hmm. because you're continuously in your head thinking my supervisor is so bad. So that's why you are not being able to communicate with him or her. Mm-hmm. So, so my, my, my advice is that if you find your supervisor is not compatible with you, if he is like harassing you, that is a different story altogether. Mm-hmm. You just leave. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a completely different scenario. But mm-hmm. a lot of times it happens that, you know, your idea or your motivation or what you are wanting from your PhD uh, is very different from what your supervisor's goal is at that moment. Okay. Right? It's not good or bad. You just have to be proactive yourself. So. Mm-hmm like you know try to collaborate try to talk to people build your network mm-hmm. as in like you know just like you are doing a podcast right mm-hmm. so you are getting to know people and mm-hmm. like you know after one year if you say that and you did i you know i need this stuff right mm-hmm. i will remember you and mm-hmm. this has been you know, organic so mm-hmm. you have proactively reached out to people in a way that mm-hmm. it doesn't seem like you're trying to you know force mm-hmm yourself onto somebody so you are mm. meeting so many new people through podcasts mm. you're like so you're building your network so you know do mm. something like that. Mm. or you know if you have a passion follow it instead of continuously talking about bad relationship with supervisor but but yes if it's it if it's um, you know harassment then obviously that's mm, a different then, story also. that's a different story i agree okay. either you report or you you know leave your phd and i write posts uh, about this a lot hmm. that I think it's like it's very important to understand that PhD is not the end of your life hmm. and you know just to you know put stuff into context the hmm. job that I'm doing right now doesn't involve what I did in my PhD so you <laughs> know me. If, even if I didn't do a PhD I would have you know had this job so you know it's not the end of the world like you know hmm. if, if, if you're not happy wherever you are just leave and move on with life you know uh, somewhat similar to this i was taught or talking one day that at the end of the day it's the skills that get us to somewhere like if exactly. uh, if we know how to do a per, uh, particular stuff then somebody will hire us uh, exactly. even in yeah. the phd it is just to get those skills how to do the re- how to exactly. do the research how to collect the data 
exactly yeah you were just getting trained on it hmm. over a longer period of time hmm. and like since it's a long degree so hmm. you can uh, you know develop other skills as well like you know hmm. you, you can develop your communication skills yes. you can hmm. get to know more people and you know collaborate learn about new stuff like so just like you thought okay i'll do this particular thing on phd mm. and then you learn so many new mm. things right mm. so th- that's what phd is all about like you know learning new stuff like and that's how i think we should all see the degree as mm. like but you know a lot of unimportant uh, stuff gets mm. you know associated with the degree which mm. i think is just useless <laughs> yes this happened this happens a lot so uh, coming on to the next point one of the another things that uh, we f- we face while doing our research because you know a research is a slow pro pro, pro process sometimes the yeah. works get done in a day and sometimes mm-hmm. it can take one year means even yeah. after one year we might feel that we have not done any, anything or in yeah. some cases the work might get done in just one day so uh, one of the things that stresses out while we are doing a research is to how to deal with the timeline the uh, the right. timeline that we have that okay we are supposed to finish this work in this time mm-hmm. but we are not done so how you used to handle the timelines how you used to ha- you used to handle the deadlines so i'll be honest with you right when i joined phd i was like even now I, like i am always like you know kind of like i have to do this stuff and i have to get this done i'm always mm. like let's get this done kind of mm. so and so initially i was uh, like that like mm. you know get this stuff done get everything done and um, so uh, but then i realized that i mean whatever the circumstances i realized that um, you know things are not going to happen the way it is in your head things are mm. going to happen when they need to happen right mm-hmm. so the only thing that we can do is you know keep learning during the time that things are not happening the way we in our heads think that it will happen mm-hmm. so so i i i learned a lot of it during mm-hmm. phd right because uh, like even when you submit your thesis right there are so many steps after that right mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. Uh, it goes to an external examiner it goes to external examiners they kind of you know check your thesis send it back so it's like so many things are not in your hands like mm-hmm. even the experiments that you do especially like experimental uh, phd's right mm-hmm. it's so much dependent on tools materials and all that stuff so the first thing i think uh, to manage the timeline to manage the degree is acceptance like you know and uh, and i think that you know even if it takes like i when i was in my second or third year i really wanted to finish my phd faster but you know after i finish my phd and after you know right now i think that you know a lot of people stress about the timeline which is unnecessary right because when you look back like uh, like we have done so many stuff like completely mm-hmm. purposeless like mm-hmm. we have spent one or two years just doing nothing mm-hmm. or you know mm-hmm. if you look ahead we will be living for like what 60 70 80 90 years right what is one or two years nothing mm-hmm. like yeah. you know but but a lot of people stress on that i have to finish in five years okay everybody is finishing in five years i have mm-hmm. to do that like you know so all this this is unnecessary stress to be honest with you mm-hmm. and um i mean nobody will ask you that why did you take 6 years to finish your phd like um so so yeah like you know we just you know kind of uh, burden ourselves with mm. unnecessary stress but uh, so um in my third year right i kind of like had two publications and uh, uh like you know i could have written my thesis in my third year mm. right but then you know all the all the unnecessary stuff started you know happening which i didn't want and uh, all of that but um but then i learned that mm. you know there are so many other stuff that you can do mm-hmm. during your time and mm. probably phd is a time where you are more at uh, you know at a calmer pace right mm. so it's a great time to actually learn stuff so mm. i think 
people should just you know chill not worry about uh, one or two years more that they will take mm. and 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 if it is a, like some people might say i am very privileged uh, that i can <laughs> you know afford uh, to do phd for five six years because probably i have a lot of money but it's not that you you mm-hmm. are getting your fellowship right mm-hmm. and if you have family i think even before doing a phd you should think about it mm-hmm. <laughs> like so i i keep writing about you know timeline as well so mm-hmm. and a lot of people come back to me like vicious people that mm-hmm. um uh, yeah you were very privileged you had the mm-hmm. money so mm-hmm. if, like if if that was the first motivation like as in like the first thing in your mind why uh, are you doing a phd <laughs> because mm-hmm. even after phd you are not going to get rich right like you will do the same like as in even in industry you are not going to be the ceo or something mm-hmm. so you will like the, the pay difference is probably what's like not as much so mm-hmm. so yeah like yeah, if if that was your worry you shouldn't even be doing a phd in the first place <laughs> of course i tell you i have met some people and they and when, and when i asked them that why you started the phd yeah. they never have answers that reach to a point that okay i wanted to find out about this most yeah. of the yeah. answers are about okay i didn't got a job after the masters so yeah please. and that's like that really frustrates me you know very yeah. common answer that i've heard the yeah. second common answer that i've heard is that phd fellowship amount is higher than what than what i used to get at the job so that's yeah. something that yeah. like, okay <laughs> why <laughs> and third one is uh, i want to be a professor so i need haan, a phd haan. i need to teach yeah. <laughs> and now it's uh, phd is needed to teach i don't know <laughs> i sometimes get yeah, I, like, you know what like you know the, like people who do phds for this reason shouldn't be shouldn't even be doing a phd in yes, the first yes, place yes 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 because phd is so, not for all of this stuff yeah exactly yeah okay so uh, coming back to the stuff so i'm really thankful with, with this thing i would like to wrap up the podcast i'm really thankful that you gave me time and you gave me no, a chance thanks to you. interview thanks to you and you know all the people uh, should be thankful to people like you who are you know bringing this stuff in and it's it's a great effort honestly thanks so much thank you no problem